Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, this has just really been very exciting for me to meet a bunch of people that I've uh, uh, met and learned to admire online. And this is I was talking to Rip about this yesterday. This is an extraordinary group of people. I'm very impressed with all of you, and uh, it's just a, a real thrill and an honor to be here. When Rip first asked me to do this, I, I sort of prepared for it, or I started to prepare for it the way I always prepare for lectures. I give a lot of lectures at our shop. And um, so I asked him you know, about PowerPoint and you know, do you want him to have an, uh, a printed outline and should I send you an outline and you know, what are the high points you want me to hit? And, and he was like, oh, shit, so like, just get up there and talk, God damn it. <laughs> so, uh, so I can do that. Uh, I'm not particularly strong or athletic or explosive, but I can talk. Uh, you just ask people who were sitting with me at Fuzzy's last night. I can talk, especially when I'm given free reign uh, in front of a captive audience, so you all are just screwed. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, uh, I do want you to know, to be aware of the fact that I, uh, that I am keenly conscious of the fact that this lecture, this time slot, is what stands between you and the barbecue. So just for my own personal <laughs> safety, uh, I will be bearing that in mind. Yeah. Um, so uh, the one clue that Rip did give me was the title of the talk, which is the importance of what we do. And that's a broad topic that leaves me a lot of leeway. And the more I thought about it, the more I sort of, as a person who likes to talk, the more I felt like a kid in a candy store. Um, so uh, I'm going to try and have a little structure to it. What we're going to talk about is the importance of what we do for ourselves. A lot of that will be familiar, but maybe some of it won't. And it's the foundation uh, for the importance of what we do, what any person does for themselves when they train. And from there, we're going to talk about the importance of what we do for our clients. And then we're going to go pull back a little bit and look at the importance of what we do for the for the greater community, for society at large, because it is important. So with all that in mind, uh, let's begin. So the importance of what we do for ourselves, of what any person does for themselves uh, when they train. And uh, you know, again, I, I think you guys are familiar with a lot of this, but as somebody who looks a lot at the strength science literature, which I'm really sort of obsessed with now, um, Every time I look, it seems like I'm finding out something new that I didn't know before. Um, right now, I'm reading the uh, Essentials of Strength and Conditioning, it's the NSCA text. It's a pretty decent, if flawed, uh, overview of strength science and exercise physiology and training. And uh, I was reading there about cartilage and how there are some studies out there in the literature that say that when you uh, do structural exercises under a load, you increase the pressure in the joint capsule, which promotes diffusion of nutrients and fluid and oxygen through cartilage and helps promote growth and repair. And, you know, I was sort of brought up to think that this was, this is a notoriously avascular, uh, atrophic tissue, that it didn't repair, that it didn't grow. And that turns out maybe not to be true. I mean, I need to look at the wet science on that, but this old man would like it to be true. Um, so, you know, I'm always learning something new about the benefits of resistance training. And um, the more we look at the benefits of resistance training across populations, the more we find it to be universally uh, beneficial. So we can start real quick and easy with the musculoskeletal system. Uh, obviously, strength training has uh, profound implications for the musculoskeletal system. Um, it goes beyond mere strength of course, all right? We know that um, the changes in the musculoskeletal system uh, have profound implications for other systems as well. But these, are, these adaptations, they go beyond pure strength. They, they are trophic responses that increase the amount of tissue, uh, they compress the morbidity of aging, they improve the quality of life, um, they preserve a full range of motion, they increase the resistance to disease and injury, strong people are harder to break, um, and they permit and promote an active lifestyle that can be maintained well into the advanced decades of life. So the way I think about it is this. Every time we train, we're making a deposit into our physiologic 401k, right? We're banking tissue for retirement. That's what we do when we train, right? Because we're actually adding tissue, or at least we're not losing tissue anymore. 
Um, so if you look at it in a little bit more detail, what we see with, with resistance training is an increase, obviously, in strength. We see an increase in muscle fiber size. We see an increase in muscle cross-sectional area, which is directly related to force production. We see an increase in the rate of force development, right? All of these things are terribly important to organisms that have to move uh, around in their daily life. We see fundamental changes at the cellular level, an increase in, in myosin heavy chain protein. We see an increase in uh, a change in the enzymatic programming of the muscle cell. We see an increase, particularly in creatinine phosphokinase, myokinase. We see increases in stored glycogen. We see increases in stored phosphagen, like creatine phosphate, and ATP, and GTP. Uh, and we see uh, a changes in ligament and con other connective tissue structures. So there's an increase in tendon density, an increase in tendon cross-sectional area, and an increase in tendon stiffness. Same thing with ligaments, joint capsules, those kinds of things, the fascia that connects the muscles. All of these things get stronger and thicker. The one thing that is common to all of these adaptations is that they're architectural, right? They are not enzymatic changes. When we train for conditioning, we're, having, we're seeing an enzymatic change. We're changing the enzymatic programming of the cell and the way it uses fuel and the way it metabolizes. When we train for strength, we're doing some of that as well, right? We are definitely training the anaerobic energy regime. But the other thing that we're doing is we're doing construction work. We're doing architectural changes. Those are the kinds of changes that take a larger investment in time and energy and work, and they're far less transitory than the changes that we see with conditioning training. Conditioning training, it's, it's something that you can do very quickly. You can make those adaptations quickly, and they, and they detrain very quickly. But the kinds of changes that you see when you're working in the anaerobic energy regime, when you're doing strength training, are, are you're doing construction. You're doing actual physical renovation. So there's a much bigger investment up front, but the changes tend to be more dramatic. They tend to have more profound implications for health, and they tend to be longer lasting. Bone density. We all know about the importance of resistance training for bone density, and this is getting increasing in, uh, attention in the literature. But there are two important caveats that uh, I wanted to point out. The first is, is that osteogenic adaptation to resistance training is specific just like all the other adaptations. You know, Rip talks uh, about, you know, you don't tan on the opposite side that you expose to the sun, right? And you don't get calluses on the backs of your knuckles when you deadlift. You get calluses where the hand connects with the bar. The same thing's true with osteogenic adaptation, right? Osteogenic adaptation is specific to the structures that are exposed to the training stress, which means that if you want to get the full benefit of osteogenic adaptation for yourself and for your clients, you have to do structural exercises, meaning squats and deadlifts and cleans, so that you get adaptations in the axial skeleton, in the vertebra, in the pelvis, in the hips, where it's gonna have the biggest payoff later in life. So the exercises that we do, as opposed to machine exercises, are the ones that are gonna cause the most salutary uh, osteogenic adaptations for our, our clients. The second caveat that I want to bring to your attention is, that there is clear evidence in the literature, and this shouldn't be surprising to anybody, that osteogenic adaptation um, occurs much more readily and more rapidly the younger you are. So when you're younger, you're able to lay down more bone mass, more bone density in response to a training stimulus than when you're older. It is absolutely the case. I, I really believe that we are helping our older clients uh, with osteopenia uh, when we train them. They are going to lay down bone matrix and it's going to improve their bone health. But again, the idea is to bank that it's just like saving for retirement. The earlier you start, the better off you are. And osteopenia, osteoporosis, is not un uh, unheard of in younger populations, younger deconditioned populations. We see it all the time. We see relative osteopenia in those people. And those people face a grim future unless they're able to, to mount an osteogenic stimulus, an osteogenic adaptation, and lay down bone mass. 
Let's talk about cardiovascular and pulmonary adaptations uh, really quickly. What we know is that, in general, cardiovascular and pulmonary adaptations to resistance training are less dramatic, less dramatic than the adaptations in the cardiopulmonary system that we see to metabolic conditioning and endurance training. In general, they are. Um, however, they are still present, and they're extraordinarily beneficial. So think about what's happening when you are doing a heavy squat or a heavy deadlift, right? So you're under a tremendous load, and you're using the lion's share of your musculoskeletal uh, system, a huge amount of structural and contractile tissue to meet with this load. And that causes your blood pressure uh, to reach some pretty high levels. I mean, it's not uncommon to see uh, in the exercise literature blood pressures in excess of 300 millimeters systolic. Normal is 120, right? In excess of that, we see all the time. That is the load that the ventricle sees when the aortic valve opens, right? That's what it has to push against. That's what we call the afterload, what the ventricle has to push against. We see a, a corresponding, although less dramatic, increase in afterload on the right side of the heart when the pulmonic valve opens, what the right ventricle has to push against. In addition, you're in Valsalva, and your intrathoracic and uh, intraabdominal cavitary pressures are high, which means that you've got some squeeze on your vena cava, which means that the venous return to the right side of your heart is decreased. So your heart filling is impeded a little bit as well, what we call the preload. So the preload is what the heart gets to pump with, and the afterload is what the heart has to pump against. Now, in general, if you increase the afterload of a pump while decreasing its preload, that pump's going to have to work a whole lot harder to do its pumping thing that it does, right? But your heart doesn't just have to maintain its cardiac output. It has to increase it because you're doing a fucking squat, right? You're, you're, you're squatting. So there's this huge demand from the tissue as well. So all of that together, the actual demand of doing the exercise, the decreased preload, the increased afterload, this places a huge structural and metabolic demand on the heart and forces an adaptation, a salutary, a beneficial adaptation. In general, what we see is an increase in cardiac mass, although there's some indication in the literature that if you normalize that to the increased mass of the athlete who's getting bigger, it cancels out some. But we do see an increase in cardiac mass. We see an increase in ventricular wall thickness. Um, we see a, a trend towards a decrease in heart rate. And we definitely see improvements in stroke volume and cardiac output. All of these things are good things. Similarly, with uh, the pulmonary system, the ventilatory adaptations that we see, they're not as dramatic as what you see with aerobic conditioning, right? Because, let's face it, when you're working in the anaerobic energy regime, your ventilation is unlikely to be the physiologic bottleneck uh, that you have to get over in order to do that rep, right? You're working in an anaerobic energy system. Nevertheless, there are ventilatory adaptations. We see changes in tidal volume. Uh, we see decrease in work of breathing. And we see an increase in what's called the ventilatory efficiency, which is the measure of how much oxygen you can extract and use per amount of air that you actually ventilate. And that is a good thing. And now we're starting to see literature on uh, the use of resistance training in patients with COPD and you know, obstructive pulmonary disorders. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, pans out in the long term. Now, we're going to talk about the endocrine metabolic. And actually, this is sort of how I got into it. Um, I happened to I, I came to resistance training late in life. I came to barbell training late in life, unfortunately. Um, but I'm interested in, in aging, and I'm interested in particularly neurodegeneration. That's my research focus. And at some point, I don't remember exactly where, I came across uh, some material indicating to me that when we squat and when we deadlift, there's a huge release of trophic factors, of growth factors into the systemic circulation. That really caught my attention. Um, and that led me to the idea of incorporating squats into my own exercise program, and that led me to RIP, and you know, 
I've just been fucked ever since, right? <laughs> so, um, resistance exercises are unique in their ability to uh, elicit a profound endocrine response. Aerobic exercises do too, but not to the degree and to the depth that we see with resistance training. And you all know this. I mean, you know that when you squat, you're releasing testosterone, you're releasing IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one, right? There's changes in insulin, there's changes in human growth hormone. And if we looked at the tissue level, if we actually looked at the vasculature, we looked at specific tissues, we looked at bone matrix, we'd probably find that there's local elaboration of growth factors in those tissues as well. But most of the study has been on the systemic elaboration of growth factors. And most of it, quite frankly, has been pretty shitty, right? So you go and you have, you have so you take Kirk and you have him squat, and then he draws blood, and then you look and, he's, and you, you look before and after his blood, and you say, here's the IGF-1 before, here's the IGF-1 after, see it went up, or it didn't change, or it went down, right? It's all, that's, it, most of that's bullshit, right? Because when you, when you look at endocrine responses, you have to look at the hormone that's upstream, you have to look at, at, the, at the actual elaboration of the hormone itself, and you have to look at binding to receptors. You have to look at receptor density and the amount of binding, and you have to look at the actual endocrine response. If you're not looking at that whole axis of events, you're not doing a very good job. And that's what most of the science looks like. Nevertheless, we do see that resistance training causes the elaboration of this profound trophic response. And you adapt to the adaptation. This is best studied with human growth hormone, which is a very powerful trophic factor. It seems that the more you squat and squirt human growth hormone, the more you're able to squirt human growth hormone in response to squatting. Does everybody, does that make sense to everybody what I'm saying there? So you become better able to mount that beneficial uh, endocrine response in, re in response to this training stress as time goes by, if you're, pursuing, <laughs> if you're pursuing a program of progressive overload. Can you say that again? So in other words, my ability to squirt human growth hormone in response to squatting gets better. Oh. It also adapts. It becomes, it's, it's trained. But here's the real money shot for me. I, I work in the field of neurodegeneration. And uh, basically what happens to brain cells after stroke or cardiac arrest? Why do brain cells die after stroke or cardiac arrest? So take somebody, you put them in cardiac arrest for 15 minutes, and then you restore circulation. As you might imagine, this is a big problem for somebody who practices emergency medicine and frequently resuscitates people from cardiac arrest. And what do you get? You get a rutabaga, right? You get a human carrot for all your trouble. It's the biggest problem in emergency medicine. This, and you, that's because you lose neurons. And you only lose certain neurons. They happen to be the neurons that you think and remember with, which is a bummer, right? These are called selectively vulnerable neurons. Why do they die? I've spent a lot of time studying that. And that means I've start, spent a lot of time studying why cells die. And why cells die is the same for neurodegeneration as it is in aging and all kinds of other degenerative diseases. Most of the time, cells decide to die. They kill themselves. It's called apoptosis or programmed cell death. And one way you can make it happen in the laboratory is you take cells that are in culture and you just remove growth factors. They still have sugar, they still have electrolytes, they still have everything else. You just change them to a medium that doesn't have insulin or a IGF-1 or whatever growth factor or serum in it anymore. You just withdraw growth factors and those cells will die. One way to think about it is, is that the default mode of a metazoan cell of, a, of the cells that we all have is not to live but to die. Without growth factors, they will. Conversely, if you take a cell and you insult it with radiation or a toxin or a free radical or something like that, that will cause it to kill itself, you can rescue it. You can talk it off the ledge by administering growth factors. And me, along with a lot of other people, have now published a lot of material in the literature saying that the administration of high dose growth factors after a stroke or cardiac arrest, at least in certain models, will rescue brain cells. Well, what's happening here is, 
As you're getting older, you're in a state of physiologic senescent growth factor withdrawal. You just don't make as much growth hormone in IGF-1 as you used to, right? And aging is characterized by atrophy. And when we squat and we squirt a bunch of IGF-1 and human growth hormone into our system, we are counter signaling that. That, is, that to me is a profound effect. That's what got my attention. It's a way for me to self-administer growth factors to myself and to tell all the cells in my body, hey, we're still in this game. It's a way for me to send survival factors to all the tissues of my body. It's just hugely profound. Neurological adaptations are important. These are the most studied. When, this is what, ha, what we see when we're looking at the novice phase in, in, the, in the literature, because most literature doesn't follow people out past the, the late novice phase. Here's a typical uh, strength science study. You take a bunch of old ladies and you train them uh, on the leg press for 12 weeks, right? And then you report to me that you didn't see a lot of hypertrophy, right? Well, of course you didn't. You saw an increase in strength, but you didn't see a lot of hypertrophy. Well, of course you didn't because most of the strength gain during that time comes from neuro neuromuscular adaptation. That being said, those adaptations are important and they're profound. They're important to health, they're important to performance, and they're deep. So what we see is an, an improvement in neuromuscular integration. We see in a, an increase in the availability of motor unit recruitment, an increase in motor unit firing rate, and a change in the way that motor units uh, fire either synchronously or asynchronously depending upon the demands of the activity, right? We see earlier recruitment of uh, high power uh, motor units, right? The larger, more high power motor units. And they're easier to recruit once they've been called into service once. So you learn how to call those more high power motor units into action. Um, you, um, you also see an inhibition of co-contraction. So co-contraction is when, like say, you're flexing a muscle, you're flexing a joint under a load, right? So you're using the joint flexor. But you also have a co-contraction if you're untrained. So what you'll find is if you do an EMG study on these people, is you'll find that they're actually firing their extensor as well. They're fighting themselves. That's a Golgi tendon organ mediated reflex, which is there to protect the joint, right? And when you train the joint, your body, your nervous system learns that you don't have to do that. And that's part of how you get stronger early on. And you have a promotion of the stretch reflex. You train the stretch reflex, which is mediated by the muscle spindle. Now, that uh, is terribly important for performance for athletes who rely on stretch <laughs> reflex, the plyometric kind of thing. But it's also terribly important to little old ladies who don't want to fall down and break their hip to have a good stretch reflex. And it's important to 52-year-old weekend warriors who don't want to act their age, right? So, these, these kinds of adaptations are terribly important. Finally, at the highest level of the organism, we see psychosocial adaptations. This needs more study. But you all know that it's real, right? If you've ever seen a 65-year-old deconditioned lady who thinks she's all done and has arthritis and chronic pain, weep for joy the first time she squats 100 pounds, or deadlifts 200 pounds, you know, there's just nothing like that. There's just nothing like that. You basically hand that person back the keys to their own body, right? And the next life stressor that comes along, including injury or illness, is going to have a different perspective. It's just going to seem that much more tractable to them. We are starting to see some literature on this, uh, that the psychosocial adaptations to resist, and I think of them that way. I think of them as a psychosocial adaptation. I mean, you can't lift heavy weight until you start to think like Kirk, right? You have to start, you have to change the way you think about things. Kirk just basically spent an hour and 15 minutes telling us about the psychological adaptation that you need to make to get under the bar and lift. It's the same for everybody, and it's beneficial. It's salutary. We're starting to see some literature on the effect of training on cognitive decline and depression. It's terribly important. So 
What we see when we look at training, what we do when we train, what we do for ourselves, is we're training the entire organism from the cellular level to the structural level, all the way up through the psychosocial or spiritual level, if you will, right? We're having a profound effect on every level of human organismal organization. And all of those things that we do for ourselves when we train, we're doing for our clients and more, right? All of that stuff we can give to our clients, we can share with our clients. So you guys, you uh, are the strength coaches. You are the ones who have the expertise in the technical performance of the exercises, in programming, in safety, in exercise prescription, in lifestyle factors, all of the stuff that's going to produce the most salutary response to training. You have learned from the foundational texts that RIP and others have written. You've learned from your own mistakes and from your experience. You've learned from your clients. Um, as a general rule, you are the people who just have, you didn't just train for your own strength, you got obsessed with it, right? So you are the people who have read Starting Strength and Practical Programming three times and they're all marked up and highlighted and notes in the margin and shit like that, right? You are the ones who went to the seminar and passed the platform and took that hellish fucking exam and got your asses certified, right? The, you are the ones, you've self-selected. You've self-selected for this. You're the ones who, you know, hang out, write articles for the site, hang out on the forums, argue with people. Um, you're the ones who do the, the, the training camps. You're the ones who came here today. Your contribution and your role are critical. So, when we talk about what we do for our clients, we have to recognize that we're not dealing with a homogeneous population, and you know that, right? We're talking about athletes, we're talking about the general adult population, and we're talking about uh, special population, and I'm gonna go over those in turn. Because you uh, live and breathe and constantly obsess about this stuff, you know that we have something to offer all of these populations. There's been a lot said here about what we do for athletes, and I don't train a athletes, and I probably won't train athletes. That's not where my heart lies, but it is terribly important. You're, it, it, it's a kind of sports medicine. You guys are the architectures and the engineers of the athlete. So the skills coach, the sports coach, he's the guy who does the software. He programs the athlete the fencer to lunge properly, or the MMA guy how to bob and weave, and, right? Or the football guy to do whatever it is football guys do, right? He, he programs <laughs> that in. And conditioning, well, Matt did a great job of showing us how conditioning, it's a big deal, but it doesn't have to be a big deal. You know what I'm saying? A streamlined approach to conditioning, right? And what conditioning is, that's basically expanding and contracting the battery pack, depending on where you are in the phase of that uh, particular athlete's training. But the strength coach, again, you're an architect. You're a construction engineer. You are, you are adding the girders, the superstructure, the armor plating, and the motor. You are building and fine-tuning the motor of that athlete. Now, if you look at athletes, who have to be able to perform at a very high level across broad domains, right? I'm talking about rugby players and soccer players and football players and MMA, right? People uh, who have to have a lot of skill, a lot of power, a lot of raw strength, and a lot of endurance. It's been most studied with uh, rugby players. There's a lot of literature, uh, strength science literature on rugby players for some reason. New Zealand and Australia are hotbeds of this sort of thing. And it's been really well described what union rugby players do. If you look at the last uh, strength science review, uh, you'll see reference to that paper. And these guys, um, they, when they are training for strength, which isn't all the time because they, they rotate through the year, they do raw strength, and then they focus on power, expressing that strength quickly. And then they do conditioning, right, as, they, as they're getting closer to the season because conditioning comes on fastest and it leaves the fastest, right? And then they play. And they, they, they're, it's not like any of these things completely go away, but they phase in and out. And then they rest, and then they train raw strength, and then they train power, and then they train conditioning. 
And these guys all get stronger over time, right? And how do they do it? In ways that are very familiar to us, with squats, deadlifts, and cleans, and snatches, and prowlers, right? These are people who are not fucking around. These are people who win or lose based on their ability to express strength and power. And they kind of show us how it's done. A great strength coach can optimize an athlete. And a shitty or a careless strength coach can expose his athlete to injury or overtraining and just entirely wreck an athletic career. So the stakes are high. For the general population, what you, what you do for yourselves is what you do for the general population and more. You provide your clients with a safe, rational, effective, proven system of training that promotes lasting physiological adaptations in an empirically progressive manner uh, that moves your clients closer to their genetic potential than they would ever get with any other mode of training. You educate your clients about the importance of structural exercise, correct technique, programming, the central importance of the hip chassis, which is a majorly neglected concept in the fitness community, programming, <laughs> energy systems, you name it. You serve as an inspiration and an example to your clients, and vice versa. I'm just going to leave that there because that's a whole lecture in and of itself, but it's something that I would really encourage you all to reflect upon regularly. You give your clients, uh, people from all walks of life who are constantly bombarded by information and misinformation about fitness and health, uh, an alternative to programs like you know, P90X and CrossFit and the thing that you roll up and fold and put under your bed, right? You give them an, al al an alternative to all of that shit. Now, I have not trained in P90X or CrossFit, and again, like Matt, I'm not here to be a CrossFit basher, but I have examined these systems, and I'm not entirely sanguine about uh, what I see. CrossFit needs to be better studied, and it needs to be better reported in the literature. But there is evidence, uh, reason, anecdotal evidence, reason to be concerned about injury rates, and a fairly unique range of injury patterns, um, including rhabdomyolysis, which really is no fucking laughing matter. Um, I see rhabdomyolysis, you know, talked about like it's a, a, a badge of honor or something. It's not a badge of honor. It's, it's rhabdomyolysis. What that means is, is that there was a rhabdomyocyte that lies, meaning there's a muscle fiber, a muscle cell that you don't have anymore, right? What we do when we train is we induce skeletal muscle hypertrophy, not hyperplasia. Humans and other primates seem to be unique in this deficiency. We don't make new muscle cells to any significant degree. When you work out and your muscles get bigger, it's because your fibers get bigger, the sarcolemma gets bigger, the fascia gets bigger. That's what gets bigger. It's not because you're adding new muscle cells. Rhabdomyolysis comes with a whole lot of other metabolic and renal fuckery that just makes it bad news. And pectoral humeral avulsions, slap tears, these kinds of things, these, these are no laughing matter. They can, you, can, you can ruin an athlete, especially an athlete my age, with stuff like that. P90X is not particularly well studied either, but when I look at both of these programs, what I see is a lack of foundation in a rational programming approach that exploits the general adaptation syndrome in a way that allows clients to reach their genetic potential in a way that is safe and reasonable. We offer them an alternative to that. P90X and CrossFit, I think they've done a lot of good and I, they are great for somebody who wants to excel at P90X and CrossFit. But that's actually not the goal that most of our clients have. So I'm a martial artist. I, I like to do classical karate kata because I think they're cool and they're beautiful. And I like to fight and spar and do MMA and Krav Maga. And um, I'm not good at any of that. <laughs> uh, but it's what I love. 
and it's what it's what I train for, and it's uh, it's important to me. And get this: when I'm on the training floor and I'm confronted by somebody that I'm going to fight, and he's like younger and faster and bigger and more pop, it's just better than me, right? Which is most of the time, right? I'm in that situation, and I don't want my muscles to be confused. <laughs> uh, I really don't. And uh, I think the same goes for the tennis player or the rock climber or the fencer, right? Or the wrestler or the football player. I don't know where this muscle confusion thing comes from. That's not what I need, right? And if you're the weekend warrior who just wants to keep up with their kids, or you're the 54-year-old accountant who wants to get back to his passion of surfing or soccer, or you know, you're the older lady who, wants to, who thinks things have gone far enough and you want to start adding some tissue back to your body instead of losing it all the time, then we offer, you offer, a system of training that is proven and rational and safe. That's important. Now, let's talk about special populations. So first of all, um, what are these children things that I keep hearing about? The, the little children things? The children things? I don't have kids. And I have some dim memories of pediatrics, but if I never have to do pediatrics again, it will be much too soon. I, I, I don't have kids. I like kids fine, but I, I can't stand to be around sick children. I'm just not built that way. And they all come with these weird things called parents, which just scare the shit out of me. And so I don't, I don't do that. But I know some of you do. And if you have the opportunity or the inclination or the responsibility of training children, um, a good place to start is with the relevant portions of practical programming. Uh, articles on the site. Bill Starr has written an excellent article. And you have resources in the community right here in the room. I know Matt trains, trains children, Tamara trains children, some of you uh, other people do as well. In general, the emphasis for kids is not on raw strength or hypertrophy. It's on technique, on building good exercise habits, and on safety, and on fun. And when you do that, you are changing the course of an entire life. How could anything get more important than that? You're teaching a kid that exercise is part of life, that it's fun, that it doesn't need to be intimidating, and that it's just as natural as eating or breathing or playing. It is playing, right? And judging from the number of chunky monkeys that I see running around out there, uh, this is a, a, a very important intervention uh, that you can make. As a side note, I do think that kids deserve a screening examination. Um, it is cheap, it's usually free in a lot of communities. You can get screening exams for free. Uh, it's non-invasive, it's quick, and uh, just very rarely every once in a while it can be life-saving because there are some congenital contraindications to exercise training before they're fixed. So I do recommend that. The elderly. So. You know, I've written about this in the past. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the elderly. What is the aging phenotype? Well, the aging phenotype in Western cultures is atrophy. It's loss of tissue. These people don't, they, their, their physiologic 401k is depleted. They got nothing to retire on. They're osteopenic. They're sarcopenic, right? The only thing they've got left is fat, right? And they've got type 2 diabetes, and they've got hypertension, and they've got atherosclerotic heart disease, the whole metabolic syndrome, what I call diatension obesity. They always come together. Obesity, hypertension, diabetes, congestive heart failure, right? Congestive heart failure, by the way, is a huge part of the phenotype of aging in the United States, and it sucks. It, if you were offered the choice between having congestive heart failure and a generic cancer, take, uh, take a cancer. The five-year mortality for congestive heart failure is just through the roof, and it's a miserable, long, slow decline. Um, who has the better quality of life? A sedentary 80-year-old or the guy who's 80 years old and can still like squat one and a half times his body weight and lift, uh, deadlift twice his body weight? That's a guy who every time he does that, he's basically flooding himself with trophic factors and sending a signal to his body that he's still growing. 
he needs to add more tissue, functional tissue, not fat tissue, right? That's huge. Basically, what we're talking about here is the compression of morbidity. That's the buzzword in the aging sciences community. I don't know of any exercise program or of any dietary regimen that significantly prolongs lifespan in populations. But I do know about compression of morbidity, compressing the decline of aging, the sick part of aging into a smaller and smaller part of our, what, can I use this, Rip? Please. If you look at healthcare <laughs> expenditures over a lifetime, you get a bathtub curve, right? So when you're first born, you use up a lot of dollars, right? And then as you go through the rest of your life, you don't use up so many healthcare dollars as a population. And then towards the end, this is what happens to your healthcare costs, right? This is what, this is what we're confronted with. I was telling somebody last night, I didn't see either one of the candidates talking about this. This is where it's at. This is the money shot. And you can affect that by bringing about a compression of morbidity and expanding the amount of time at the end of somebody's life that they're functional instead of allowing them to go into this long, slow decline where they just sort of dwindle over time. And that's going to be huge. We're really talking about medicine here. And of course, when we talk about medicine, we think about treating sickness. And that's just this really fucked up sort of Western medicine outlook on things that's finally starting to change. Medicine at its most powerful is about the promotion of health and the expansion of human potential. That's what medicine is. That's what real medicine is. And preservation of health and physical and psychological functioning. Nevertheless, we have to talk about the sick. That's the ultimate special population, right? Um, the take home message here, just to sum up a whole lot of literature, is that with very few exceptions, everybody who can lift weights should lift weights. There are very few exceptions. They exist, like if you've got a, a six centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm, I'm not going to train you, right? There's certain neurovascular conditions and valvulopathies and stuff that may pose contraindications to resistance training, but those are rare. In general, people who can lift weights should lift weights. And we see now literature, data on patients that you would have never even dreamed in the past of putting under the bar. We see data on patients with congestive heart failure. We see data on patients with uh, neuromuscular degenerative diseases, data on patients with arthritis. We see data on patients with kidney failure, patients with dialysis-dependent kidney failure. I mean, these populations that you would have thought, you know, you should get a laminated no-duty chip. I mean, really, a little old lady with congestive heart failure or a guy who's on dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you think he gets a pass, right? No. The literature tells us that these populations tolerate resistance training and they benefit from it. So, in, you know, and you can decrease hospitalization. You can increase their sense of well-being. You can decrease their need for medication over time. That's huge. And that's going to have profound implications for what we're going to be doing in the future. And the reason for that is, is that the smaller studies that we've seen to date on this that have now led to some meta-analyses, larger studies, that tell us the same thing, are going to lead to high-quality longitudinal studies with large populations that are going to, they're going to look at really important endpoints like rehospitalization, healthcare costs, outcomes, and those are going to get the attention of leading physicians and hospital administrators and healthcare system administrators and policymakers who are desperate to do something about this, absolutely desperate to do something about this frickin' asteroid. And when that happens, 
they're going to say, Jesus, get me a strength coach into this hospital for crying out loud, anything that they can do. And suddenly, you're going to be on their radar screen. That's what's going to happen, right? It's just, it's going to be pure actuarial financial impetus that's going to drive people like you into a role of real importance. So that brings us very, very nicely to the topic of what we do for the larger community, what we do uh, for the public. And that's a lot of things. One of the most important things is, is that we're changing the perception of what exercise is. You're changing the perception of what exercise is. You know, Rip's written about this. Other people have written about this. For decades, there was this attitude that exercise was aerobics. And resistance training, to the extent it had any role at all, was machines, right? Those were the sort of like equations in people's minds. So, you know, if you needed to get in shape, just get yourself an, an easy glider. Or what, remember the easy glider? Anybody remember the easy glider? It's awesome. Um, my mom had an easy glider. Um, it's probably still under her bed. Uh, so here we have to give RIP and CrossFit their props. You know, we've talked about this before. They've done more than anything to help restore barbell training to its rightful place as the resistance training methodology of choice. And the biomedical literature is increasingly attentive to the potential of resistance exercise, especially for special populations. It's up to us to keep this, uh, per moving this perception forward. You guys need to cast a wide net taking on clients from all walks of life, promoting the correct perception that barbells are a safe, powerful, progressive, that they are, in fact, a fundamental, primary, not an adjunctive, but a primary mode of exercise training and fitness. What else do you do? You challenge silly bullshit, right? You all are living, walking, breathing, squatting refutations of silly bullshit. I love the way that Rip exercises silly bullshit, and it's one of my favorite things to do. I had a gas writing the misinflammation article. I mean, the, there's a lot of bullshit out there. And you guys have to be on top of your game, and you have to challenge it. Squats are bad for the knees. Icing will stunt your gains. You'll stunt the child's growth. You'll stunt his growth. His bones will never get, you know, shit like that. You are the guys who, who are going to be out in the trenches fighting silly bullshit. Changing perceptions of physique, beauty, and health. This is critical, right? So in Western cultures, we are confronted by a pathologic spectrum of dysfunctional phenotypes, of, dis of dysfunctional body types. So you got the Doc Al fashion model, right? Every time I see a picture of one of these people, I want to put them on a cot and put in a feeding tube. Right? You got that. You got this, you got this skinny six-pack abs kid, right, who, uh, you know, he won't eat, but, and he can't squat, but he's got his freaking six-packs, by the way. You got the, you got the Schwarzenegger phenotype. You're not a real man unless you got bulging biceps and chesticles and 6% body fat and, you know. And then at the far end of the spectrum, you've got this ridiculous obesity acceptance movement. Right? The obesity, except the kind of bullshit that Paul Campos publishes, the obesity myth, the myth of the obesity myth, really pisses me off. Yes, it is possible to be cardiovascular fit, strong, and fat, right? Sumo wrestlers, power lifters, right? It's just really freaking unusual in the general population. I mean, let's face it, if you're fat, you're not fit. There was a Louis C.K. routine where he goes to the doctor and his ankle is hurting. He goes to the an uh, doctor and the doctor does an x-ray and he puts up the x-ray and he says, uh, yeah, your ankle's it's fucked up. It's wore out, you know? And uh, it's like, what do you mean it's wore out? It's like, they, they, they wear out, you know? And, and uh, yeah, it's fucked. And, and uh, it's like, well, can I, can I do something? <laughs> do something? Yeah, you can, uh, you can like, you know, stretch it and, Front it around. It's like, well, how long before that works? Oh, no, that's just something you do now, you know? Uh, and, and so Louis says, he says, so I say to the doctor, like, what if I was an athlete? And the doctor's like, you're not an athlete, <laughs> right? Same thing with fat people, right? 
the, the whole fat fit kind of thing. It's unusual. It's not unheard of, but it's unusual. And this whole idea of obesity acceptance is just as damaging as the runway fashion model phenotype ideal, right? You guys have to be out there challenging that. That's part of what you do, changing our, our concept of what physical beauty and health look like, right? I see a lot of beautiful people here. They don't look like fashion models. You can bring strength training to special populations. Now, not all of you will want to do that. There are unique challenges and there are risks, not because barbell training is risky, but because we haven't killed all the lawyers yet. But some of us must do it and some of us will do it. So a huge impact on public health and public health spending through compression of morbidity and promotion of health and fitness and strength, particularly in special populations. So what is the importance of what we do? I think you can sum it up this way. Properly conducted, rational, programmed barbell training is medicine. That's no longer a particularly radical thing to say. The American College of Sports Medicine is out there with their exercises medicine program. It is medicine. It's a powerful medicine. It has protean multi-system effects. Uh, and it has some characteristics that are, are like other medicines, but it's unique in several ways. First of all, this medicine is available in a broader range of doses than any drug, than any pharmacotherapy, right? It can be more exquisitely titrated to the needs of the client or the patient, if you will, than any other drug. And that's good because the dose of this medicine is constantly changing over time, right? It's constantly changing over time. That's programming. That's periodization. Um, with this medicine, the dose goes up as the patient gets healthier. Kind of an interesting thing to think about. This medicine must be taken for a lifetime. This medicine can be shared with friends and family in the community. I mean, you know, so can your Vicodin, but that's you know, not a good idea in general, right? <clears throat> this medicine uh, actually decreases the need for other medicines. That actually makes it fairly unique. Think about it. Most medicines that we administer, pharmacotherapies, they treat a specific physiologic parameter or symptom, and they come with untoward side effects. And so we need another medicine to treat the side effect. And then we need another medicine to treat the side effect of that medicine. What you end up with is the 70-year-old little old lady who ends up in my emergency department. She says, I'm weak and dizzy. And I look in her bag, and she's got three antihypertensives and a diuretic and an anticholinergic to help her sleep and a sedative to help her relax and a medicine for her blood sugar. And shit, if I was taking that stuff, I'd be weak and dizzy too. Right? It's called, it's a disease. It's a new disease and it's epidemic and in the industrialized world, it's called polypharmacy. And it is rampant and it's potentially devastating. This medicine actually decreases the need for other medicines over time, which makes it unique. This medicine must ultimately be self-administered. Uh, we can teach, we can instruct, we can motivate, we can provide inspiration and expertise and facilities, but only the patient can administer this medicine, right? which requires a unique commitment on the part of the patient, but at the same time allows the patient to take ownership of his health and performance. So, let's sum up and get to barbecue. Every, no, uh, I've got one more thing I want to say, and in fact, it's actually in a way it's the most important thing, and it's the thing that's going to get me in the most trouble. Every month, um, I get a, um, a CME program, a continuing medical education program. It's called EMRAP, Emergency Medicine Reviews and Perspectives. It's a couple of hours of CME to help somebody like me who's in a very broad-based, challenging field try and stay on top of things. Um, it's uh, presented by this uh, crazy Australian guy called Mel Herbert. He practices at USC now. It's very talented, very smart, very silly. Um, it's very entertaining. But at the end of every episode, he always says the same thing. He says, um, be safe, be well, and remember that what you do matters. Now, 
I really need to hear that about once a month. I'm very privileged to work in a field where I get to do some cool things. I get to save lives, I get to save limbs, and I get to decrease suffering. And yet, even doing that, it's easy for me to forget that what I do matters. You can get crushed by the administrative concerns and the bureaucratic concerns, and there's a lot of what we do that's just futile care, and sometimes it's easy to think that we're missing the point. And I need to be reminded about once a month that what I do matters, and I think you do too, that what you do is really, really important and that it really, really matters. You know, you're not saving lives or prolonging life every day, um, but trust me, that's not always a good thing. But improving health and decreasing suffering by improving health and function, that is always a good thing, and that is what you are doing. And so I'm going to go on a limb here and say something that I think may raise hackles in some quarters. The way I think of you now, the way that you will be thought of in the future, and the way you should start to think of yourselves is as allied healthcare professionals. I believe that that is what the future holds for you, and I believe that that is the way that you should think of yourselves. You are the guys who will be filling the exercise prescriptions that must form a, a central part of any future healthcare system. Regardless of whether Obamacare stays in place or we get it replaced with something else, there has to be a revolution in American healthcare, and that will involve exercise prescription, and that will be you guys, right? This is not me stroking you. This is not me flattering you. This is me putting the weight of the world on your shoulders. This is a call to duty. Your privileges and your responsibilities, I believe, will be exactly analogous to that of the physical therapist, the perfusionist, the scrub nurse, the respiratory tech, the genetic counselor, the patient advocate. It's a privilege, but it's also a huge responsibility. You have to maintain your certification, whatever it is that RIP decides needs to be done in order to do that. You need to come to this meeting on a regular basis, right? You need to be involved in training clients. You need to be familiar with current controversies in uh, fitness science and at least to have some, something like an educated opinion about them, right? You need to, to stay on top of the literature. We're gonna do what we can to help you with that. But there are responsibilities that go with this. And based on what I've seen here, I don't think that's gonna be a problem because I see some pretty extraordinary people here. But that's how you need to think about yourself going forward. You are allied healthcare professionals. You reduce the burden of morbidity. You set patients up for a lifetime of health and success. Uh, and you have something very, very profound to offer those people uh, and society at large. And what you do really, really matters. It's really an honor for me to talk at this initial meeting of the SSCA, and I thank you for your attention.